The Lower Fraser provides important nursery habitat for wild salmon making their way out to the ocean. Over 1,500 kilometers of side channels, sloughs, and tributaries have been disconnected from the Lower Fraser floodplain by flood control structures such as dikes, pump stations, and flood boxes. Our Connected Waters campaign aims to upgrade these flood control structures to restore fish passage and help our struggling wild salmon populations. We spoke to people tackling this issue to better understand how we can protect our communities from flooding, ensure salmon have access to their habitats, and ensure farmers can safely produce food for the region. The whole Lower Fraser River and estuary has a huge problem with a lack of connectivity. So from the flood control structures that are more in the, in the river itself, down to the estuary where we have numerous jetties and causeways that really alter connectivity, really change the way that fish move around in the estuary, change the kind of habitats that used to exist in the estuary. So it's a big problem, uh, not only from, from flood infrastructure, but from uh, other, uh, other water control infrastructure that we've built in the estuary as well. And so I think it's really important that we work to really reconnect those habitats. I refer to the salmon as our family. And right now our salmon are in big trouble. Their numbers are crashing. It's my dream, my vision, if you will, to have the dikes opened up in strategic places to make the slough tidal. It's a place where salmon could be going. We've been displaced from managing our resources for over, I would say over a century and a half. Sumas Mountain was one of the areas where many of the Stalo and our people found refuge. I can say things about 1924 when they decided to pursue the draining of the lake. Uh, my great grandfather was uh, the leader at the time, the chief here, and he essentially said when you drain it, if you can drain it, because they didn't believe they could, right? Our, our, our people didn't think they could drain such a big, uh, vast lake. But if you drain it, you're going to drain and starve us, and you're going to take our economy away, our livelihood. So Estalo is river, the Fraser River, the river of all rivers, and we're river peoples. Essentially, we should be fishing in this river. But if you look at it, I don't know that I would eat too many fish coming out of this river right now. The legend was was that there was so much, and, and of course they're red, right? Our name means red fish up the river. Our elders' legends were basically, you could, you, could, you could walk across the backs of the salmon because it was so abundant. They built the dikes around us, and so it increased the, um, you know, first of all, the chances of flooding, but annually we, we have this risk. We have a cemetery just down the way, actually at our IR2, and that's where our development site is, and, and actually that gets flooded out almost every year. So we have a project on the Fraser River which will alleviate erosion of our recessed dike. One of the offsets might be to include a connection from the Fraser River into Zate Slough to provide the freshwater inputs. The plan is to put culverts from the Fraser into Zate Slough so that you could improve flow of water. Right now, it's a stagnant slough. It's almost, it's basically a lake at this point. Not only is it a reconnection, but it's also to improve uh, water quality and hopefully salmon habitat. When you see habitat restoration projects, you quite often see people doing spawning habitat, but quite often that's not what limits a population of salmon in a particular river or a particular area. It's quite often enough spawning habitat, but what does limit a lot of populations is the ability to rear juveniles, for juveniles to survive. There's very high mortality of juveniles, you know, whether they're from salmon farms and, you know, things like that. Or when you get flooding, uh, you get stranding of, of juvenile fish in the margins of rivers and things like that. What we're seeing right now is why this gate works well compared to a regular gate that doesn't um, that is not controlled by a hydraulic arm. So a tide gate is set to close at a certain time. It doesn't close automatically because water is flowing backwards. 
When you look at the water right now, you can see that the tide is rising and the Fraser is backing up, the Coquitlam River is backing up, and you can see the water flow through the gate, under the dike, and into the rearing habitat behind us. A typical gate will close as soon as water starts to flow backwards because that's just the way it's supposed to work. But because it has a hydraulic arm, it's actually set to close when the water level reaches a specific height. When it reaches that specific level, the arm will close and protect the lands from flooding behind the dike. So I think this is a really great example and I'm really glad that we're here to see, to see this in action. I think there is buy-in for, let's say, doing nature-friendly flood mitigation, but someone has to pay for it. Here in Agassiz, though, they've done some work at the Hammersley Station. They've got two fish-friendly pumps, two screw-type pumps, and that was a lot of money. We've got very, very expensive, productive farmland here in, in the lower Fraser Valley. We're producing a lot of food here. There is a long growing season. There's adequate water. There's a lot of this, yeah, it's, it's well drained, it's flat. There are ways that I certainly think you can work with the the environmental side, the, the townsfolk and stuff, recognizing as a dairy, as a farmer, there are limitations. There's a lot of things that we probably unknowingly have impacted and we're now starting to make corrections. So uh, Spencer Creek is a smaller tributary that feeds in to Kanaka. And it's really important that it's finally been upgraded to be fish friendly because we need to make sure that we're supporting um, the wildlife in our community and the fish in particular because I feel that they often get left behind and forgotten. Our goal is to make sure that we're protecting the natural environment and that we're enhancing it. We're making sure that it's accessible and available to the public and that we are building in a way that protects the environment but also allows us to expand cities and, and build out and that's that's a real struggle for every community. Salmon face many challenges, but increasing salmon habitat is a key part of rebuilding wild salmon populations. We all need to get on the same page. We need to plan our flood management in a way that considers wild salmon. And we need to dedicate the money and energy that is needed to ensure that this work is done.